four, three, two, one. <clears throat> Good morning, Shan. Thank you Good so morning. much for coming over. Uh, it is going to be pleasure talking to you, understanding from you about your business. What what mistakes did you make in the last one year, or uh, what or what learnings did you get in the last one year? How how some of the people in in the world in the e-commerce business can can use your learnings, can use your uh, mistakes and can learn from them. Uh, we're talking a lot today. Uh, thank you so much. So guys, uh, Shan is in the cannabis and CBD business and um, the, the business is in the US. Uh, she lives in LA and the business in the US is pretty gray at the moment. It's perhaps under-regulated. I'll take, I'll, I request Shan to talk about her business and herself and give us a, give us a preview about herself. Hi, I'm Shannon. I'm the VP of Marketing for Omura, which is a, a whole flower vaporizer company. Um, what makes us a little bit different is that instead of grinding up your flower, um, what you do is you take a pre-filled flower stick, um, which is this little guy, it's a little tube, he goes in and the device automatically goes on and you vape your flower right out of the mouthpiece. And then the stick is biodegradable and compostable and he just kind of goes in the compost or the recycling or however you want to dispose of it. Um, you know, the last year has been really interesting. I think everyone, I mean, we're almost at the year date where LA locked down, which was March 16th. Um, I can remember distinctly, we were supposed to be going into the office and we got all on a call as an executive suite and we're like, we're locking down, we're staying home. So that we thought that was gonna be two weeks. It's a year later, I'm still in my house. Um, so it's been a really interesting year. Uh, the cannabis and hemp CBD industry are almost in some ways two different businesses that are regulated in two different ways. Um, hemp CBD is federally legal. Um, it was legalized in 2018 in the, under the Farm Act. THC is still illegal federally um, and is legal in different states and none, no cannabis can cross state lines, nothing can cross state lines. So it's, they're very different and very regulated industries uh, and it creates a lot of complexity from a marketing and e-commerce business standpoint. Um, I would say a year ago, THC businesses, most dispensaries barely had online menus, right? Everything was based in brick and mortar. It was like go into the store, buy what they have, who knows what they have. Um, there will be some level of consistency and there were some brands that were like statewide in California that you could regularly find, but there was a lot of inconsistency in inventory and, and stacking and kind of every availability. And then COVID happened and everyone was like, oh my God, we need online menus and we've got to have like a real online marketing presence and really pushing that presence out there. Um, so that's been really, I think, helpful for the THC business because a lot of trends that have happened in regular retail, like click and collect and all of those other things have now started to kind of influence the THC industry in a really positive way that I think is allowing for different people who maybe didn't love the dispensary experience to experience THC and shop for it in a way that feels really native and kind of custom to them. That was kind of a long-winded introduction. <laughs> <laughs> not at all, not at all. So tell us something about you, Shannon. Who, who is Shannon? What does she like? Who, are, who do you meet? Uh, what friends do you have? What values do you have? What movies do you watch? Uh, anything and everything about you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have lived in LA for six years. Uh, I'm a full West Coast convert. I grew up on the East Coast in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, and I love the sunshine and the beach and living out here. I have a golden retriever dog um, who is my like buddy and we hike on weekends. And I like, I you know, I think with a West Coast life is really a kind of like an outdoorsy kind of life, which I absolutely love and enjoy. Um, other than that, I got into the cannabis business because I like cannabis. Um, I found it when I moved to LA and you were using it to treat anxiety and pain and all these other things that like I was using different things to do. Um, and cannabis for me was just like such a much more natural, clean way that made me feel so much healthier treating those things. And so when I got into this business, it was something that I just felt really amazing about. 
Um, and even now it's like, I'm the one touch answer for like anyone's questions about CBD or THC or I need something to sleep or I need something for this. And, you know, I think even for my mom, um, who doesn't live here, but like was having really bad knee pain, came out, got her some like really low dose THC pills. She was on this other stuff that was making her really sick from the doctors and she got onto that. And then it just became a whole new thing for her to really like enjoy um, and fix her pain, right? So I think it's just this plant has had such like a stigma, especially in the US. And so I'm such a huge advocate for its benefits. So that's something I really care about. And that's why I really took my job at Omura and I'm why I really love doing this. Excellent, wonderful. Thank you so much, Shannon. Uh, I think this is Wendy, right? You got to unmute yourself. Yes. Hi. I'm sorry. I was a little late. My last meeting just just wrapped up. No problem. No problem, Wendy. Let me just put your your name and your company name. Uh, as, Here, I can uh, do it for you. I can do you're it. gonna do it. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Excellent. So, uh, Wendy, we have Ka uh, Shannon here and. Uh, Shannon is actually a is actually a canon of cannabis uh, and uh, CBD. She is in that business and she loves to be uh, there. And she 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 knows everything about the business. And we'll talk more about her and her business in a bit. Uh, meanwhile, if you can introduce yourself and your business. Sure. So my name is Wendy Bronfen. Um, mm -hmm. My company is called Homeolux. We are a um, health and technology company. We design, develop, and sell uh, wellness products. We fast track scientific research to do that. So we're a group of consumer wellness product developers. Um, and what, it, what, what, what happens in the world is uh, there's a lot of solutions that people need. Um, scientists work on these solutions and then it takes a long time for the, that scientific research to meet the hands of consumers. So we are particularly interested in brain health. Um, in fact, everything we do is in service to uh, people battling cognitive decline or Alzheimer's. So we say, think of us like the Peloton for your brain. We offer um, hardware, which is light, light, uh, lights that pulsate at 40 hertz per second. That's 40 flashes of light per second. And that light therapy is known to induce healthy brain, um, brain habits. Um, and we combine that with a software platform of um, health and wellness routines. And the, the, the ultimate goal is the way to beat cognitive decline is through prevention. Um, and we're right now we're a startup. So most of what we do is we're selling to the pain. So we, we talk a lot to customers who are experiencing um, cognitive decline or dementia. Excellent. Wonderful. I have not heard this before. I'll be honest, brutally honest with you, but this is amazing. We'd love to talk to you more about, more about your business. So uh, just to paraphrase, you have, you have invented a device which throws light at your brain so that you can inculcate good habits. Uh, and and uh, inculcate, because I have been reading all these books to inculcate good habits. I, I, can, I can use your product. Uh, so, and it also helps to uh, reduce and prevent uh, cognitive decline, which basically means that if, you, if you're losing memory and if you are uh, if you have Down syndrome, perhaps, and if you are not able to uh, no, not not Down syndrome. Okay. No. no. So it, um, one way to think about it is that, so I'll just quickly explain parts of how the brain works. But all of our brains function with a specific gamma rhythm, right? Like we all have, just like we have heartbeats, we have healthy rhythms in our brains. Over time, as we age, plaques build up in our brain, amyloid plaques build up in our brain. Plaques are sticky substances. And, and as those sticky substances build up, and it happens to everybody, but in, in a brain that experiences dementia, particularly Alzheimer's, that plaque slows down the brain's rhythm. What scientists are learning is that 40 hertz light therapy will inculcate or help your brain mimic that healthy brain rhythm again. So just the way plaque builds up on your teeth, you get gum disease, plaque builds up on your heart, you get heart disease. The, when these plaque builds up on your brain, you experience dementia. So the goal is just like in the seventies when everybody started living a heart healthy life, um, we think the next big trend is everybody will be living brain healthy lives. 
Excellent. Wonderful. Uh, it's a great topic to discuss. I'm, th- I'm sure a lot of people can learn from you and from your from your company. Uh, thank you so much, Wendy. Wendy, tell me, so why are you doing what you're doing and what have you been doing previous to this company? My, my personal background? So my personal background is has always been developing um, new technologies for consumer needs. So for a long time, I worked in education technology and built lots of fun products to help children learn to read, learn to do math, learn all kinds of things. Um, and, and along my professional journey, I ended up on the other side of the spectrum. And while I used to make technology for four and five-year-olds, now I find that I'm making technology for 40, for 75-year-olds. Um, and I think it, that while it seems like such a different chasm, you know, book ending lifespans, um, it's very similar in terms of both um, product design, but also product marketing, right? So when we were designing interactive products for four-year-olds, sorry, that's my daughter's iPad. <laughs> Um, when we were designing um, interactive products for four-year-olds, it was, you, you had to be really careful and precise in designing, you know, directions and, and, and user experiences for little kids and little hands and all of that. And now as I'm designing products and, and experiences for older people, the most important thing is to understand what are their needs, right? And how do we design things for them? Um, and also, you know, just making things that are designed specifically for them, right? So, you know, the, the, the best diet and exercise routines for the three of us, they're not crafted for somebody who's, who's 70, right? So if, if I design um, a great diet and exercise routine for a 70 year old, I wanna make sure that they're able to complete the entire activity, that that activity is doing things for them that, you know, our, the three of our routines, like you, the three of us aren't spending time doing exercises to, to, to solidify our, our muscles for balance, right? Like we're not worried about, can I, can, I, um, can I sit down and stand up well, right? Those aren't our exercise routines, ours are different. Um, for, for my audience, they need things like 15 minutes of aerobic activity. That wouldn't work for our age group. So just, you know, as we talk about e-commerce and marketing, it also has to do with uh, the user experience of the design. You design something that is specifically for that audience. Very interesting, very nice. Uh, great, thank you so much, Wendy, for that initial introduction. Uh, Sharon, coming back to you, um, a lot of people tend to misuse uh, cannabis and CBD. How do you bring them back on track? What do you, what do you tell them? What do you say to them? I, I, I would say I was one of those people, uh, like, you know, and I, and I love it, but I think everyone dosing is really hard, right? I think it took us a long time to figure out dosing via alcohol. If you tell someone like you're, how are you going to feel after one beer? They can probably tell you they can't do the same with cannabis. And I think dosing is a giant problem. Cannabis is trying to solve. I think everyone's trying to solve it in different ways, which I love um, because I think we've got to solve this for people because if it really needs to be a medicine, it needs to be dosed appropriately. And especially because people are using it to treat real diseases. So dosing is, is crucial to the way that cannabis continues to move forward and that people have faith and confidence in taking it. So the way that we've designed our system is our sticks are pre-filled. So there is the little stick in there. There's a little bit about a flower in the bottom. It's consistent in every single stick, every single time. So the way we've designed our product inherently solves dosing. Uh, If you are, have like, you know, a heavier user, they can layer multiple sticks. So someone who's a heavy cannabis user may have three sticks versus someone who's a light cannabis user may only have one, right? And I think dosing is huge for us as an industry moving forward. It's a pain point for me, even in other products I try, um, because it's so hard to get right. Um, But I think it's something that we're starting to get closer and closer to solving as a business. And I would say, if you're a little bit scared, start small, right? I think there's a thing where people like, don't have the whole edible, 
don't have like two sticks start with one ease your way in see how you feel in an hour and then if you're feeling okay you can have more um but i think a lot of times people just are like oh i'll have this whole thing and you're like no 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 don't do that i think it's really about starting to figure out where you feel good and what feels not great and then really kind of living right there excellent now yeah. tell me about your online journey how is this business uh, flourishing not flourishing how are you doing this online yeah absolutely so hemp cbd we can sell and ship nationwide. So that is a Shopify experience that we've built out over the last year, which is, you know, an amazing platform. Fantastic. We were on WooCommerce before that. Uh, it wasn't working as well. We were seeing a little bit of like drops in conversion rates and those sorts of things. So we ported over to Shopify last year and really kind of tightened everything up and feel really great about that platform. THC is a very different experience and we actually plug in with a lot of partners, um, sites like iHeartJane and Dutchie, which actually provide the POS menus um, for most of the T THC dispensary partners we work with. And so we really manage like our listings and making sure we show up appropriately on those sites. And then those just back end plug into the POS systems with our retail partners. So they do have kind of two different infrastructures, um, but I think they're both equally important for us. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah. My one follow-up question to you is, why did you move from WooCommerce to Shopify? What was not working for you in WooCommerce? I think there was a few things. Mm -hmm. It was a little bit, we were had some like slow kind of load problems. We had some glitch kind of issues. And then I think the other thing that we found, especially in cannabis and CBD is, we have a really hard time with payment providers. So because it's federally illegal, banks don't want to work with THC brands um, or even hemp CBD brands. They're very reticent to partner with consumers and, and with kind of online stores. So we had like, you know, payment providers were like bouncing you to a second site to fill everything out and you're starting to like lose conversion in that moment because it doesn't feel like, a normal Shopify checkout experience, which is how most people are used to checking out these days, right? You know what a Shopify checkout experience looks like uh, if I serve it to you. So I think for us, it was also about moving to that, what I would call more known kind of entity to build that faith and credibility in a consumer because this industry is a little bit in that gray area. Um, and it's just harder for people to have that faith that like, this is real and it's not shady. So how do we continue to build that trust in those moments? And it's known platforms help us build that trust. Excellent, wonderful. Thank you so much, Shannon. Uh, Wendy, coming back to you, uh, is this the only product you are selling or you have multiple products? So the, what, the hardware that we sell is um, these light systems. Um, and the way we sell them is in, there, there's multiple configurations. So you can have one light that you keep close to you. We call it the Beacon 40. The product is called Beacon 40. We, we have Beacon 40 Solo, um, which is one light, just looks like this. You keep it next to your desk. Um, my mom uses the lights. She's got two lights set up around her TV and she keeps those, you know, what are they like 14, 15 feet away from her. And then we have an institutional kit that we can sell into memory centers and community centers and spaces like that. And that kit configuration can be four lights, seven lights or more. So we have um, you know, one solution in multiple SKUs and configurations. Mm -hmm. So and, yeah, carry on. Well, I was gonna say, you know, if you wanna talk about commerce for us, our biggest learning journey is what I was talking with you about earlier. It's about understanding that customer. So because we're selling to people who are experiencing their first stages of cognitive decline or they're suspicious that they're there, we learned that it's hard for them to do things like type in a discount code and type in every digit of their credit card number, which is something that you know, for, for many of us, you don't even think about that, right? Or there's, you know, that, that kind of one click ship thing. Um, so we've, over the last year, really spent tons of time and energy building out the simplest checkout experience that we can. I mean, you know, it's funny, 
you, you send out a discount code. I'm sure, you know, Shannon maybe has done all this. Everybody who's in e-commerce has done this stuff and you see your sales rise and we're like, oh, that was great. That discount worked. And then when we analyzed, did that discount work with how many abandoned carts did we have? And then we spoke to those customers and the abandoned carts didn't happen because somebody changed their mind or for whatever reason, those carts were being abandoned because the form fill was too hard for many of our customers. And many of those customers also aren't, uh, I don't know, you know, gold standard e-commerce shoppers, right? They're not, they're not like ordering all their groceries and their shoes and their clothes online. Um, but so, so learning about their needs and having to dramatically oversimplify checkout was a big deal for us. How did you, how do you, how do you, how did exactly, exactly solve this problem? Um, we, so it's funny, we, we um, just built a really simple checkout. We're using a tool called Spiffy right now. We did, uh, some things are like simple and obvious, you know, those things are like, why didn't we think about that before? So rather than saying type in the discount code, we would give folks a link. If you see this discount code, click here and the discounts automatically applied. It's just one of those things. And, and you could argue like, hey, um, you're losing on breakage where somebody might have tried to buy your product without the discount anyway, but that's that's less important to us, right? So, you know, we just wanna, we want to make this as easy an experience for our customers. So that's, you know, that was one thing. Um, and then trying to get people, like our upsell process is un unusually simple. You don't have to retype your address in again. You don't have, like we autofill a lot of things and we just, we basically have treated our checkout like a Japanese garden. You know, we've removed every single click or move that anybody would have to make and still allow it to work. Fabulous, wonderful. Is there an echo in the call? I think so, it might be. Yeah, uh, hello. Yes. Okay, it works well now. <laughs> All right. So, uh, <clears throat> Can your product be also be used by younger generation, Wendy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as I said, really, it, it's it's just going back to that toothbrush analogy. Like if, if you have tooth decay and you start brushing your teeth for the first time when you're 60, your teeth are, sorry, <laughs> you know, um, your, your teeth are going to be in trouble for a long time. But what all the scientists, um, what all the scientific research is showing us is that um, the right time to start using um, light therapies like this, the right time to start living a healthy life is early on. And what all the scientific research is saying is that just, you know, lead, living a healthy life with a Mediterranean diet, having a good balance of exercise, social engagement, mental engagement, if you start that early enough along, you're best chance of beating Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline is always going to be prevention. Um, and, and while we all know that's true, you guys are marketing experts. We're a startup. We're selling to the pain right now. Um, and our, you know, and we're, we're doing great. We've got tons of good traction. We've got market fit. We've got, you know, our pricing all right and our messaging all right. And our next thing to do is to expand um, to the preventative, preventative market. Excellent. Are you guys funded or bootstrap? Um, we have one angel investor who got us started. So there's a there's a man. His name is Terry Moore. He is a business philosopher and a marketing um, executive, and um, he had a personal experience not dissimilar, unfortunately, to many other people. Um, his wife was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and that news hit his family like a ton of bricks. And he went to his doctors and said, "What do I do?" What's the pill? What's the solution? And he, like so many others, learned that there is no cure for Alzheimer's disease. So he went out and started doing research and discovered um, a lot of these um, research articles that I'm referencing to you guys. A bunch of scientists at the, the highest institutes and in brain health globally were doing studies around this 40 hertz light solution um, combined with 40 hertz sound solutions. And he, um, brought together a small group of entrepreneurs. We built a prototype. He started using it at home and he saw dramatic positive effects on his wife's condition. Her doctors turned to him and said, hey man, where can I get 
more of these. Um, and then he decided to fund um, the operating team, which includes myself and my two partners. Um, and we spun up the business and went through all of the stages of early startup. Um, and Shannon's nodding her head like she knows exactly what I'm talking about. Building prototypes, um, doing research, focus testing, building a go-to-market plan, understanding the customer and then launching. And so that's where we are now. Wonderful, wonderful. There's a, there's a concept. So both of you and the business of relieving pains, both of you are have also ha, had also had some mess which are converting into a message. So basically they say that a lot of people have their very strong mess and they convert their mess into a message. Uh, for example, in your case, uh, Wendy, this guy had to had to go through a mess and he converted that as a message for somebody and now using his mess to give away a message and cure people uh, using his mess. And same, similarly, Shan was maybe, maybe a little over using her, her the cannabis other stuff and she is now trying to make people realize the importance of dosage and the right amount of it, thereby relieving their pains. So both of you are doing a fabulous work. I'm sure you have very strong whys. When you're able to link your why to your business goal, you get it you do it because you are linking your business to an emotion, your goal to an emotion and the, and the emotion you are able to link by if you answer your why, why are you doing what you're doing? Fabulous. I mean, uh, have, I'm having a great time. Uh, uh, Shannon, coming back to you, uh, the pain that is being relieved by taking the cannabis and the CBD, is that a temp temporary solution or is it permanent? I mean, can it become permanent? Yeah, I mean, it is in some ways temporary, right? Like the effect that that feeling lasts is is temporary. So, you know, what I think vaporization technology, which is what our device is, um, it's the most immediate way that you have the most bioavailability in order to affect that. So inhaling actually through your lungs is the fastest way to get to that relief, right? Um, I, you know, we see effect in like 10 to 15 minutes, like max. Um, so you're starting to feel stuff kind of right away. Stuff with like edibles and other form factors, you know, you're seeing hour to two hours later that effect um, be relieved. This is temporary, but I, you know, the only ways we really have to treat pain mostly are temporary at this point, unless you're talking about like a larger scale surgery to fix a bigger scale problem. So um, it's definitely a temporary solution. But I think the other thing about it is about cannabis is that it also offers those other benefits of, of like that relaxation um, and, and kind of other ways that you feel kind of better that are not just straight pain relief uh, that people really enjoy the plant for. Does it, does, it, does it also have, does like cannabis and CBD, do they also have a placebo effect? I mean, there's, there's a limited amount of research. I'm sure that that's true. Uh, I'm sure that the placebo effect is true as it's proven out in science more often than not but it's not something that we've really seen um, in the way that people kind of experience our product. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Sharon, in your business, you are a VP of marketing. So, and you're saying marketing is a challenge in this business because you really can't do ads. So you really can't do much in marketing marketing. So if you can't do ads, you may you perhaps write blogs and articles. So how do you connect with customers apart from writing blogs and articles? Absolutely. So while we can't do paid social, um, what we do is we do a lot of influencer marketing. We do a lot of partnership marketing. So influencers are really big for us. I think cannabis is in some ways a word of mouth discovery business, right? Because you're either getting that word of mouth from someone online or you're getting that word of mouth from a friend in real life, or you're getting that word of mouth from a bud tender at a THC dispensary. So the business has really built itself on that word of mouth marketing. So really getting in there and talking to influencers, getting them on our side, making sure they're really strong advocates for our product. Those are the people we partner with that 
really understand what the plant can do. Those are the kind of great people we work with. There is some advertising we can do. We can, you know, buy ads on some platforms, but we can't do Google search. We can't do Facebook. We can't do Instagram. So it does really focus our energy and attention on places where we can have a maximum amount of impact. I think PR is also really important for us to make sure that we're getting out there in longer form pieces where we're doing that education because our product does require a level of education and longer form and like deeper partnerships really help with that. I'm sure in Wendy's business as well. I, I'm sure marketing to that age group is a little bit different, but you're talking about a deep education piece there, right? Knowing that you have this problem, knowing, finding this solution and educating on how this solution actually works means that like a five second Instagram video isn't really going to cut it probably. So I think that level of deeper partnership really helps us activate well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, uh, uh, Shannon, so you, you spoke about these partnerships and you spoke about so many other things that you do for marketing. What are the key performance indicators, whether your marketing is working or not? How do you measure the effectiveness of your marketing? It's a great question. Um, I think the best thing about e-commerce is we can track it, right? We can see, we can use UTMs, we can see where the links are coming from, we can look at our traffic and we can see if those people are converting. You know, we also have multiple affiliate programs that we run that we can also track through that as well. So I think for us, that's just the fastest and easiest. Um, Ultimately, we do look at the ROI and like what was the spend versus what did we make out of it. But I also think, you know, we're also invested in the lifetime value of our consumers. So while your ROI may not be one to one in the very beginning, if you have a product that ultimately equals replenishment, which is, you know, the way our product is designed, it's designed with replenishment in mind, the lifetime value of the customer is as important to us as the like ROI of the ad for that one day that it was live. How are you able to determine the lifetime value of the customer? It's a, it's a math equation, really. I mean, it's, you look at kind of how much, you know, what the first purchase is and then how many flower stick packs they go through a month, assuming. Um, and then you Mop that, map that out over kind of a year or two years or however long you decide with your finance team you want to do that. Um, and then that's kind of your lifetime value of your consumer. And, and we really almost do that on the CBD side and the THC side as almost two different entities. We feel and we know there is some crossover, uh, but it's hard to map that because the, the kind of THC data from a consumer standpoint sits so, so separately than the CBD data, but data sharing and data tracking within the cannabis industry is getting better and better you know, every month. So hopefully as we start to get more and more access to data and that data gets better and better tracked on the THC side, we'll then be able to look at that overlap between the THC and CBD consumer and see really what they're up to because I actually think that lifetime value might even be more as we look at those consumers layered on top of each other as one actual person. Excellent. Thank you so much, Anna, for that. Uh, Wendy, coming back to you, in your business, what do you what do you mostly focus on? Where does your time go? Um, so we really divide the work that we do into uh, strategy and innovation around new product development. We maintain the run the run the business, right? How much time and attention do we spend running the business? Um, and and then there's all the supply chain operations and manufacturing. We have, you know, a hardware business as Shannon knows too. It's, it's, there's a lot to that, but the bulk of our time and effort is right now around sales and marketing. And then right now we're raising funds. So um, the leadership team spends um, uh, probably a little bit too much time fundraising right now, but, but um, sales and marketing is, is uh, our primary focus. Mm -hmm. So, you, it did, I'm sure you would have also would have competition in this area. Uh, how's the competition doing and how are you taking care of it? There's, there's really, it, you know, when we, when we look at the landscape, right, there, there are 6 million people, almost 6 million people in the United States over the age of 65 who are living with an Alzheimer's diagnosis. 
Um, and there are six, almost, almost 17 million people who are providing care for loved ones who are battling cognitive decline. So if you think about that scope, um, that, that, that this is affecting so many different people, we think the competitive landscape is relatively barren. There's one other company that's making a consumer product like ours. Um, and frankly, I think it's a side hustle for them. They, they, they aren't investing in, um, they don't have that consumer user centric focus that we have. So their product is, we don't barely consider it competition. The other side of the competition is um, scientists and uh, researchers who are daily developing um, and doing clinical tests and trials around 40 hertz light therapy, 40 hertz sound therapy, and all the other wellness routines um, associated. And their product, two things, their, their products are today being designed for lab use. Um, and once again, if you saw them, it's like they're designed by scientists. They have no user-centric design like we do. They're testing lights that are clipped into nostrils. They're testing lights that are in these big awkward lenses. And we love it because we rely on their continual research to fuel our next direction, right? But they're, they're spending millions of dollars on that research and we applaud it, right? Um, and then their sales channel, when they get FDA approval, which takes many, many years, their sales channels will be through doctor's offices um, and through prescriptions. So that's, that's, it's like, Maybe we maybe that is our competition, but we love it. We love, you know we we really are leveraging their scientific research to fast track these wellness products to consumers because the while they're doing all these human clinical trials, the lights are they're safe. They're like they don't even give off any heat. It's sort of like having a candlelight next to you. So it really is for us an information campaign. Um, and you were talking about. Um, the, the mess that's out there. I mean, there, there's, this is a really personal and pressing need for so many families. Like we know that they're going into their doctor's offices and they're walking away being told, go home, get a coloring book, get some puzzles, um, try to get some exercise and stimulate your brain. And for, for families like mine and my partner's families, I mean, we come, we're very lucky. We come from very scientific, um, intellectually curious families, um, if a doctor gives you a prescription for coloring books and puzzles, it just doesn't sit right. So people are looking for um, an alternative solution that's backed by science, and that's what we're providing. Fabulous. Fabulous, Wendy. Uh, tell me about your sales channels. You are selling on uh, offline, D2C, Amazon, what are sales channels? Yeah, so we launched the business um, in January of last year, and we started selling everything direct, digital, e-commerce, um, and uh, and once we started getting traction there, we then uh, in at the beginning of March started to spin up um, a program where we were selling into senior centers, but we of course because of COVID immediately had to shutter that. And our relations with senior centers became um, a more, more more charitable angle of partnership, and we stopped selling in because um, you guys know that those places were hit hardest by COVID. Um, and so our plan our plan for the last ten months has been entirely e-commerce driven, digital sales. We have some partnerships with um, with. Uh, wellness groups of medical professionals who are interested in new product innovations and they recommend them to themselves. Um, but once, once things can open up again, um, we'll do dramatic opening of, of channel sales. But right now everything is uh, e-commerce sales. We do sell on Amazon, but we're driving everybody to our, our uh, commerce site. So How something, you... yeah. oh, no, I was just going to say some, something like a uh, high 80% of our sales come through our, our store. Um, and we leverage Amazon for the, you know, trust and ratings and things like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Are, are you showing all your products on Amazon or only a bunch of them are Amazon and the remaining ones? Yeah, we don't sell the institutional product through Amazon, but everything else. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 
So uh, what are you using for on D2C? Which platform, Shopify? We had been using Shopify, but we're, we're um, shifting over to using Spiffy right now. Um, we have, we have, we have uh, requirements for uh, communicating with our warehouse, with our operations, because we're, because we're hardware driven um, or because we're hardware led, we have all kinds of uh, needs to put the orders through and to get them through to um, supply chain. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how is Spiffy better than Shopify? We've found that it helps us, as I mentioned, with that super simple checkout experience and the okay. ease to upsell products. So we, we've been, honestly, we mess around, we test things all the time. Um, but because most of the sales are coming through our commerce site and because of our needs, specifically for the simple checkout, potential for an upsell, and then all the back end, we're finding that Spiffy is working well for us. Mm -hmm. That's do you new. also email marketing? Yeah, we have, uh, we do. So we, you know, we follow the traditional funnel. So we have top of the funnel, middle of the funnel. And, and, and just as you know, you're discussing with, with Shannon, we do have a, a learning curve. So we expect the, you know, the funnel to, to have its, to, to, you know, we, we require all the stages of the funnel um, and we, you know, our goal is to eliminate friction all along the way. We meet people where they are. We target them, you know, top of the funnel, middle of the funnel with email campaigns, with newsletters, with long form, um, as well as short form, um, and then just drive them through, you know, to get to get to the sale. Excellent. What do you, what do you use for email marketing? I think every, for us, everything goes through HubSpot. And I would say the other thing that we've done is We've, um, we've, we really do support multiple touch points for communication. So truthfully, we have customers who say to us, I'm trying to buy, but, I, but it's checkouts not working. And usually because we know our customers now, we know that means somebody's having a difficulty putting their credit card number in. And if, if, if somebody sends us an email or sends us, um, a, you know, we have live chat, we're, we try to be very responsive to those people. And I know that everybody says this, you know, like the customer is always right, help the customer. We really have um, a dramatically compassionate and sensitive approach to customers because our customers are naturally confused and it's really frustrating um, for them if they can't get their product because they type their address in wrong. Like they just transfix their home address number, which happens sometimes, right? Or as I mentioned, if they can't type in their credit card number. So we're not afraid to pick up the phone and call somebody if they need a phone call. Um, we, are, I believe that our chat conversations are probably a little bit uh, longer than some other, some other groups. We do have a lot of that chat um, automated. Um, and then our emails, our email communications are, are probably, you know, two or three steps longer than others. Um, but what we've learned about that is at the end of that, we're getting, you know, customer responses and reviews. Like I've never seen it any other business. I mean, people are saying in a time when everything's gone automated, thank you so much for your personal touch. And, and I'll tell you guys, a lot of that personal touch is automated, but then when needed, we really do get in and get personal if, if it gets there. Excellent. Wonderful, Wendy. So you, you do some even marketing as well. How are you able to reach to your customer segment uh, with emails? I mean, do they really read, read your emails and understand your emails? The, does emails work for you? Um, I, I, our long form ads, I think are our most successful um, point of contact. Um, and then I, I, you know, yeah, I would say our long form ads are probably our, our, our best. And then it, emails work, they tend to work by, uh, middle of the funnel and lower in the funnel if somebody's abandoned a cart and they've abandoned the cart for some reason. Um, and because of, because of the pressing need that doesn't go away for our product, we're finding that anything that, as I mentioned, an abandoned cart is usually because there's been some kind of challenge in checkout. That is, not because our checkout is broken or something else. It's just the natural, uh, the, the natural challenge of why people need our product. Mm -hmm. 
So, so those, those targeted emails that, you know, those are, those are our closers. Excellent. How, how, how big is the email list? Oh boy. I know I'm supposed to know that, but I don't know it. It's thousands. <laughs> thousands. Okay. Excellent. And you use some tool, email marketing, so email marketing tool, or you use HubSpot. Send, HubSpot for sending out emails. Okay. Mm -hmm. how, how do you, so how do you personalize your emails then in that case? So a couple of things. And, and, and I mean, I guess I should tout why we, because as I mentioned, all these touch points for our customers, everything falls back into HubSpot. So if a customer um, sent us a message in chat and then sent us an email, we, we, we have all that customer data um, in HubSpot. So we know, hey, this person had trouble here, this person had trouble here. Sometimes we can help problem solve for them because they've written their address to us in two different places and we notice that the address is inconsistent with what we have on file. And we could say, hey, there seems to be some inconsistency in your address. Why don't you double check that, send it back to us and we'll, we'll help resolve the problem, something like that. Um, but I'm sorry, what the question you asked was, how do you personalize your emails oh. if you're sending it through HubSpot? Um, we HubSpot holds customer information, so we know their we know their names um, and can can put their name. We know their names. We know where they are in the funnel. And we know you know we know we HubSpot tells us all that about them. So HubSpot is our tool to help us personalize all this. And mm -hmm. I would also say we um, we tested personalization of our emails and our and our um, campaigns and that personalization really worked and you know it's funny like we're the cut we're the type of organization if that personalization hey wendy didn't work we would have pulled it off in like a new york minute but because it did work we're keeping it on there so again we always remove every bit of flair or functionality that we think is standard if it's not necessary, but personalization is something that we did find works. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It does work. And so I'm talking about a second level of personalization. The first level is where you put the name right. Hey, Wendy. Hey, Shannon. The second level of personalization is when you actually also personalizing the product the person wants. For example, let's say if I want CBD and if you are giving me THD, then perhaps that's not personalization because I don't want THD. If I want shirts, if I got an offer for t-shirts, that's not personalization. So uh, are you taking care of personalizing the products as well automatically? Is that, is that if not, is that your goal to person, for example, let's say X, Y, Y, if, if, if let's say Shannon wants shirts, we should not be sending her offers for t-shirts. That personalization I'm talking about. From, from my perspective, um, we have institutional customers, as I mentioned, and, and consumers. So we've, we've separated messaging for both of those audiences. Um, and then we do help guide people through their choice in hardware. But when we're selling to individuals, we're basically selling a light system. And then we bring them down the funnel of you know, are you a one light system person, a two light system person, or a four light system person? And, and that's just a, that's a decision chain. But we, you know, we're not like a big shoe company or a big fashion company where I'm not trying to sell you shoes when you're trying to buy t-shirts. Mm -hmm. So when you're saying you understand whether the person is one light person, two light or four light person, how are you able to determine that? We, no, we help them walk through that decision chain themselves. Oh, so we, which, you know, choose the light that's right for you. Would you do you, if you're going to use the light while you're answering emails every morning um, in an intimate setting, you might be a one light person. If you're going to use the light set up while you're watching TV at night, you're a two light person. If you want to fill a room while you're, you know, a game room or a card room or media room, you may be a four light person or family. And that's, we, we, we walk them through that decision chain. And sometimes, you know, we'll run a campaign promoting one of those products to make the decision chain really simple. Interesting, very nice. That's, that's a good technique. Thank you so much for that, Wendy. Uh, coming back to you, Shannon. Uh, in, so how, how big is the team, Shannon? We're small. There's uh, four of us total, uh, including me. So mm -hmm. um, we kind of divide up in, in roles and responsibilities. Um, we've got a kind of 
like two digital marketing managers, uh, one that focuses on like social um, and paid and influencer marketing. And then I've got one that manages all our dot coms, our digital experiences, our email lists, everything else. And then we've got kind of what I would call like design and conception like person who um, she's an amazing designer and maker and she helps us design everything from like retail displays because we're still in retail stores to like actual sales collateral that goes out to turn kind of various channels. Mm -hmm. So we're, uh, Shannon, Shannon yeah. we're way bigger than you. We're six. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. Uh, so uh, Shannon, how big is your email list? You also the try thousands. to reach people. Yeah. And, and we've been working on sub-segmenting that list out. Um, I think for us with the I think there's the easiest segments of like THC and CBD. Um, but, you know, we also have products that have aromatics and herbs in them. And some people are into that, right? Some people are into like a, some peppermint with their CBD to like get a different feel and experience. And some people aren't. So we also are sub-segmenting out within the CBD groups um, to make sure that we're serving them the right products. Or if we know you really like the aromatics, you know, we just launched with a brand, co uh, a brand called Bluen, or sorry, not Bluen, Barbary. Um, and Barbary has like um, a bunch of kind of herbs and aromatics in their CBD as well. And so we then target like those consumers that we know already like some of the other aromatic cues we have. Mm -hmm. So uh, Shannon, what do you use for email marketing? What tool do you use for email marketing? We use Klaviyo. Uh, what do you like the most about Klaviyo? Um, I think it's really comprehensive um, and it, partners really, really well with Shopify. So really being able to track like from that email, it drove this many dollars in conversion. This is what converted the most. You know, it really allows us to track through the system about what our consumers are motivated by and what our consumers are interested in, um, which is really important for us to know as we continue to look at a product roadmap and what we want to develop next. What do you think Lavio can improve on? It's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think the hard thing about email marketing is just like the level of like almost cleansing of your lists you have to do all the time. Um, it's it, it's a it's kind of similar in social. I feel like you've got to like to make sure that you're actually targeting the people you're targeting and you want to target. I think we've got some like it's just a lot of legwork now to do that. So I think if we can kind of look at how you efficiently get that done and take some of that kind of what I would call like heavy lifting off my team. That would be really amazing. Excellent, wonderful. Uh, if I have to ask you, Shannon, if you want to, if let's say you have to give an advice to somebody on starting an e-commerce business right now during these time, what would you talk to advice? I think, you know, I, th I think it comes down to a lot of what Wendy was talking about as well. It's about product market fit, right? I think you need to know who your consumer is and who you're targeting and, and make sure that your product is designed for them. I think we see a lot of products that exist that like, you're like, it's, it's, it's a mess, but I'm not sure that it's found it's like messenger yet, right? It hasn't found its audience. Um, and I think for us, that's what I would recommend first, because once you kind of find your white hot center, it's a lot easier to expand from there. Hello? Okay, Wendy, you're still moving. <laughs> we may have lost him. Awesome. Oh. Well, I agree with what you said, by the way. <laughs> oh, we really lost him. He's the host you're, of the not meeting. Not Oh no. <laughs> Wendy, how long ago did you guys launch your business? Uh, January of last year. And it's I'm a, sorry, I was late. What's the name of your business? Omura, O-M-U-R-A. Oh, that was your last name. No, <laughs> that's the business, yeah. Okay. Uh, we, launched, we launched in THC in January as well of last year. It's such, that was such a hard time to launch because it feels like you got like a month of traction and then 
everything happened with COVID, like right in kind of beginning, middle of March. And then it was like, oh no. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but it, you know, for, for both of our businesses, there was opportunity there, right? People being home, people spending time online. Absolutely. I think that's been super helpful. I think um, I think even cannabis being deemed as an essential good in most of these states, I think started to like open people's eyes to it. Like, why is that happening? Oh, maybe it actually is good. And I think just getting them to explore a bit more. Um, mm-hmm. We saw a lot of different consumers in store that we hadn't seen before. Um, a lot of women in store that we hadn't seen before in cannabis, which was really amazing. Um, Where I are you being? Are you oh, here? I'm in LA. Hey. Welcome hey, back. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I got cut off. I don't know, some internet issues. So uh, I could not hear you, Shannon. I think I asked you a question. You said you spoke about product marketing fit. You know what? There's a concept of product marketing fit and all of that. You do your research and all of that. But also there's a very important concept of following your passion. And when you're following your passion, you don't really see whether the product fits the market or not. For example, I'm sure, when did, did you do a product market fit before getting into this business? Or did you just follow your passion? We, we did a couple things. We recognized a tremendous need. Um, we recognize an available solution, right? So here's the need, you know, Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline is a, it's a, global health crisis waiting to happen. And it's a personal challenge for a lot of families, right? Definite, as you call it, the mess, definite definition of problem. Solution, scientists are researching and pushing through medical device technologies to address this problem. But that solution, if you take the medical device path is 10 years to market. Because that solution is safe and, and, and you know, productizable, we said, can we make a consumer product for this? Can we price it well? And then you launch your test and you decide, is that product market fit, right? We knew the problem, we knew the solution. We just didn't know, can, can we market this right? But since then we have proven product market fit. I don't think you can necessarily start with, with, with proven product market fit. You can start with a really good assumption and to answer your question, um, every single person on the Homeolux team that's working to make these Beacon 40 lights has a family member or a close connection with somebody who has struggled with cognitive decline. And it's a, it's a very slow and cruel um, disease. So we are all um, aligned in this mission to provide some help and hope for families that are going through this. It's hard to meet somebody who hasn't been touched by this, but yeah, we're very mission driven. Excellent, wonderful. Uh, guys, it's time that we to say goodbye to you. And I really wanna thank both of you for your generosity. You have been extremely generous in sharing what you have learned, what mistakes did you make. Uh, a lot of people in these, in, in these times can use from you, can use your learnings, can use, your, can use uh, what you have taught. And I really appreciate you being so honest and so kind. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I, I wish you a fabulous uh, Friday and Thursday and a fabulous weekend. Uh, and we will be in touch. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure to meet you both. Thanks for inviting Thank us. You. Thank you. It was great. We'll be, we'll be, we have recorded this session. We'll send you the entire video and also send you small snippets, like five minute snippets. Uh, we'll cut the video out into 10, 15 snippets and send you those snippets as well. When we do that, when we send, when we uh, post those snippets on, on social media, we'll tag you. So please accept my uh, friend request. I'm going to be sending you on LinkedIn uh, and um, then we will be able to tag you and uh, take it forward from there for marketing. Thank you. Awesome. Thank Very you much. so much. Take Have a great day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.